So it's my pleasure to be talking to Natalie Seahy today about the connection between nutrition and gardening. We've focused a lot on how to grow things, but we haven't really focused on why. And this is coming from a generation that really did love those Cheetos and Tostitos and some of those foods that, you know, the nutritional value is maybe a little less. So Natalie, talk about your experiences with and what you do and your passion about nutrition and growing your own food. Yeah, so thanks for having me, first of all. Um, I think the great thing about growing your own food is it gives you the opportunity um, to expose your family, whether that's younger kids or older kids, to food because we all know um, it's not really nutritious unless they actually consume it. So gardening gives you that opportunity to kind of take it from the beginning um, through the end um, with consumption. I love that, not nutritious if you don't eat it. So that yeah. pepper plant can sit or that perfect tomato and there it sits and then the squirrel gets really, really good nutrition. <laughs> so, so why are people, uh, especially families, doing gardening? Or what, what sort of persuasive speaking do you use or fun things you've done with your own family? Yeah, so I have four kids. Um, teenagers as well as a younger one who's nine and um, kind of their whole life they've enjoyed the garden that we have in our own backyard and we talk about that with families that we educate um, within our different programs um, but you know I think you mentioned at one point kind of the plant it pick it prepare it and I think that applies to letting them even pick things out at the store that they want to grow so those plants um, that they want to grow in their garden um, and then also once it's in the garden, picking it and giving them the opportunity to try it. And sometimes, uh, you know, just seeing that plant grow, whether, you know, it's the, from the flower all the way to the fruit or the vegetable, really helps them be excited, you know, to try it or at least, you know, touch it. And sometimes that helps kids, you know, really want to give it a shot. So, so making that connection between they get to pick it out to start with and then grow it and work with it. How much of that then do you see translating from children into their parents or into their peers? Does, you know, I, I look at some of the peer pressure of, oh, you've got to wear these shoes or, or yeah. you know, follow this person. Does the same thing happen with nutrition and food? And do they make that connection or is that just one in there that those of you who really do know the nutritional value can say, oh, the red pepper versus the green pepper, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think peer pressure has a lot to do with the kids like it. I think a lot of times we see those kids that are a little more self-confident, mm -hmm. being the ones like, yes, you know, I really want to try it. And then there's, there's those that are a little more hesitant and it takes a little bit more prompting. You know, we talk about using your five senses. So really allowing those kids to explore it. So taste it maybe comes last because they're smelling it, touching it, really looking at it first. And then there are times where we even encourage kids like, don't yuck my yum. <laughs> so um, yeah, so we're like, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, maybe thumbs in the middle. But again, that peer pressure does come into play. And if some kids are maybe on the yuck side, um, it influences their peers. And so we do try to play on the the yum side so that those kids are willing to take at least a bite and it might take you know 10 times or more for um, kids and even us as adults I know there were things that I didn't like as a kid and and grew to like as I got older so that, that's a great way to think about it and I'm sure kids have fun with that as well <laughs> yep. so do you see particular successes is it colorful? Is it small? Uh, you know, the, the ones really that you would encourage, especially starting out younger or, or new gardeners to try for the nutritional value, what comes to mind with that? Um, I think smaller um, is, is easier for kids. They're maybe not intimidated by a large tomato. So if you look at something like a cherry tomato or, or the little mini peppers mm -hmm. are great. I know I grew those in our garden for the first time and they tasted just like what you buy at the store. They're nice and sweet and they're little. You can mm -hmm. prepare them or just pull them out of the, the refrigerator or straight out of the garden with a little rinse of water and eat them. But um, I know my kids always say, mini tastes better. You know, it's kind of that bite size. But on the flip side, you know, something big like a, a pumpkin, 
can get kids really excited too. So seeing that grow from something really tiny to, you know, who knows, there's the giant ones that can really get kids excited, especially if they like sit beside it and see it grow. Sure. Um, can yeah. just create that excitement and then realize they can eat it, whether that's the pumpkin itself or maybe the seeds. Oftentimes kids are excited about that too. So food safety, of <coughs> course, and food insecurity are, are things that we also talk about a great deal. Um, do you, and this is a generalization or a general question, do you, do you consider food that is grown in your own space safer? That's a great question, and I think there's a lot of education that can be tied into that too, just in terms of you know, making sure the soil or the potting um, area that you use is, I'll say clean, but it is dirt, but right. um, just keeping in mind, are there pests, are there animals, are those sorts of things that come into that? But, um, I you know, we really emphasize whenever you pick something from the garden, make sure you rinse it under cool running water before consuming it. <laughs> Which, of course, is <clears throat> hard to do if you really want to just pop yeah, that tomato into your mouth. Yes, and we, you know, have been known to do that. <laughs> Little cherry tomato, or like I said, those mini peppers are right. easy to pop one in your mouth when you're picking. Exactly. So, but ideally, yes. Rinse so, it under cold so you're involved, water. Natalie, with SNAP. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about SNAP and your programming and the way you do educate. Yeah, so part of the funding that I have for um, my position is through the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, it's the education arm, so SNAP Ed, which focuses on providing nutrition education and food resource management skills to families with limited resources. And then we also do work um, like the gardening projects that we do that help with improving food access in communities. And I would think as we move forward into whatever 2021 is going to look like that that will become even more important and I'm assuming that a part of what you saw last year was the need for a lot of that kind of education. Is that true? Yeah that is true. We saw a lot of families that were maybe a little concerned about their food access and where were they going to get some of that fresh produce that they'd been accustomed to. Um, you know, we were limiting trips to the grocery store and those sorts of things. And so uh, we did partner with folks from Horticulture, mm -hmm. um, Terry James, specifically on helping to get some plants into the hands of families that could use them or into our gardening projects um, across the state that helped improve food access. But we did see a lot of families growing their own plants, which is exciting um, just because it's a new thing. And, I'm continuing that education into 2021 so that hopefully they can do it for another year. That's awesome. So again, we, uh, we love to talk about this kind of thing both on Lifestyle Gardening and on Backyard Farmer. Natalie, thanks for coming in. I'm sure we will have you on again come the real gardening season <laughs> starting in April. All right, thank you.